Good morning, sir. Good morning, Prashant. How are you, sir? I'm all right. How are you? I'm fine, sir. Thank you, sir. Even after my lectures, you people are fine, huh? Then you have sir. strong. <laughs> you have strong <laughs> immunity systems. Hmm? I thought my lectures were more poisonous than the COVID-19 virus. <laughs> we are very fortunate to listen to your classes, sir. Actually, uh, I thought to, I mean, I am I am very interested to listen to your class in Yasmin Nan classes, sir, because you are experts in your subjects. <laughs> Thank you, Prashant. That's very nice of you. But somehow I always thought my classes were toxic. <laughs> Anyway, so there are enough of us, so let's get going uh, so that we don't fall back or fall too much back in terms of time. Uh, I had finished this point of political philosophy, delinking ethics and politics. Uh, if you remember, I first told, told you that point number three, uh, political philosophy as forwarding moral and ethical concerns came up in ancient Greece in the uh, philosophies of uh, political philosophies, that is of uh, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, and uh, I told you that with Christendom rising to power in the medieval period, you have the use of ethics and morals in order to completely vanquish politics. And everything was subsumed to the Christian religion everything was subsumed to this idea of Christian virtue, which was living a good life. And this good life then was defined as per what was written in the Bible. And I told you because of this, there was no politics at all. And then I talked to you about the Imperium and uh, uh, about the Sacerdotium uh, and how uh, Franciscan friars like uh, Marsilius of Padua and William of Ockham had basically advocated the uh, separation of uh, the temporal realm, which is the material world in which we live from the spiritual world the eternal that is so the idea was that the pope will head the sacerdotium sacerdotium is the sacred which is the church was considered sacred so the pope will head the sacerdotium and the imperium will be headed by a monarch or a king. That is what was advocated by Marsilius of Padua and William of Ockham. And kings, though they found this support, still had a problem. And the problem was that when they staked uh, their kingship and said, or rather they stake their candidature uh, for the kingship. And they were asked on what basis would you become king? So the argument given then was 
that we will be our kings by divine right god has willed us to be kings and this turned out to be a self defeating argument because the moment god was invoked uh what happened is that the church came back into the picture and said listen we are the true representation of god on earth the pope is the true representation of god on earth so what is this divine right that you are giving to this to the kings and to find a way out of this i told you nicolo machiavelli basically decided to uh separate ethics and politics strategically because he felt as long as ethics morals are not separated from politics then politics will not have an independent or the political realm will not have an independent existence uh, of its own that is basically what uh, was felt by machiavelli so machiavelli actively advocated the separation of the two realms and in doing so he got himself a very bad name and subsequent philosophers and commentators such as leo strauss uh they called him a preacher of evil and machiavelli nowhere talked about uh, i i told you if you remember in the prince or il principe there is only one instance where machiavelli makes a reference to a god and he says to an unknown god i had told you that i hope you remember not the christian known god so he was one of the first of the tradition of the antichrist thinkers and therefore a christian thinker like leo strauss i mean when i say christian leo strauss was a political philosopher but also was a practicing christian and therefore he found uh, machiavelli uh, to be preaching evil so you have this whole idea of machiavelli as preaching evil and you then have to uh f- uh look at various developments that happen later which always portrayed him as somebody who was wicked who was uh pragmatic to the extent that he did not have anything called ethics in him but if you read later interpretations of machiavelli if you read the interpretation by quentin skinner uh, which was the example that i quoted uh, skinner says machiavelli is no preacher of evil in fact there is nothing to suggest that there is any evil in machiavelli machiavelli was only trying to build an independent political realm which would not be subordinated or subsumed by the uh, religious realm so he says there's nothing evil about that and that is the view that most people hold today so that delinking had happened but uh the delinking led to its own problems so in the 18th century uh in germany we find uh immanuel kant and to a certain extent arthur schopenhauer to thinkers who tried to reimbue uh politics with morals but i will not talk about this now because um 
if we talk about this now, then we will be going ahead of ourselves. We'll talk about this when the time comes. Uh, what you have to uh, remember is that this dethinking of ethics and politics was also a successful uh, a successful agenda because uh, of the rise of capitalism in the modern period. And if you look at the nature of capitalism, the nature of capitalism is that for its survival, it basically uh, relies on profit. Any enterprise that is taken up by a capitalist is for the sake of profit. Otherwise you lose money if you don't, if you make losses. So by privileging uh, profits, profits, sorry, otherwise it might, you might think I'm saying profit, uh, profits, uh, by doing that, uh, it looks, not it looks, it was capitalism that pushed ethics and morals into the background. If you tried to be ethical all the time, then you could have failed as a capitalist, as an entrepreneur. So this delinking process was also aided by the rise of the capitalist civilization uh, about which we shall discuss when we talk about John Locke and the other social contractualists. But for now, I'm going to leave this point here and go to the first point, okay, which says political philosophy as mirroring reality. Very often people have asked me a question about why we should study political thought or political philosophy or political theory. Why do we need to uh, understand what Aristotle said or what Plato said or what Machiavelli said? After all, these are people in uh, our past, what relevance do their ideas have for the present? This is a question which is legitimate and it has been asked many times, not just by my students, but by many people. And the answer given to that usually is that political philosophy mirrors reality, which means if you study political philosophy as <coughs> sorry, as uh, ideas in a context of history, then you get an understanding of what the situation was like in those days, in the days when Aristotle wrote or in the days when Locke wrote or in the days when Kant wrote, what was it like? So it, it mirrors that reality and contemporary political philosophy because we do have contemporary thinkers Unfortunately, the greatest of them passed away a little too early in life, which is John Rawls. But you do have other thinkers. Uh, you have thinkers like uh, uh, Habermas, Jürgen Habermas, uh, who's still alive. And uh, till the beginning of this century, we did also have 
uh, Michel Foucault, we had uh, Richard Rorty. All of these people unfortunately died a little young. Uh, but Habermas is still there and Habermas's philosophy uh, has taken turns and twists over time. Uh, so it is supposed to be mirroring. So what Habermas says or what John Rawls says is supposed to be mirroring a reality. Let us for a moment pick up the example of John Locke. Now John Locke argues that uh, those people who had property are rational and those people who did not have property are not as rational as the ones who have property. Okay, you must remember here that Locke said all human beings are equal in the sense that they all have been endowed with the rational capability. But he argues all people may have rationality, but not all have the same amount of rationality. Okay. And he believed that those who were more rational, they got ahead in life, accumulated more property. They proved that they are capable of taking care of themselves. So he wanted to entrust uh, the responsibility of taking care of society only to these people, only to these people who had accumulated property. He created the 40 shillings per week rule, which is uh, you were considered propertyed if you had savings of 40 shillings per week and you didn't need to spend them. So that was the rule he laid down. He said the others have proved that they cannot take care of themselves and that they are uh, therefore not qualified to take care of the government. So when we talk about Locke, we usually talk about limited government but rarely do we talk about limited democracy because not all people have the right to participate. He called these people who had uh, enough property as civil society. The way Locke used civil society is very different from how we use the term now. I'll get into that later when the time comes. But remember, in the case of Locke, it is civil society. I mean, civil society is that body of people who have a certain minimum property. And these are the people who enter into a social contract to create a sovereign authority, not the others, because the others couldn't take care of themselves and therefore you wouldn't want to trust these others with, uh, you know, you wouldn't want them to, you wouldn't want to trust them with taking care of society. This is a kind of an argument that we hear in some sections of society, even today when people say, you know, our democracy is where people are given money, the poor people, uh, and these people vote because they have been given money and therefore we have very bad leaders, we have very bad governance. 
So these are all arguments that quite a few people make. And these are arguments that many people um, find them, uh, find uh, as accurate, but it is not really so. Um, education and money don't have much to do with each other. I've seen a lot of people with degrees who are extremely uneducated, okay? Which means they don't have the power to judge what is right, what is wrong. They don't have that. And uh, they are unaware of what ethics and morality are. But that's a different issue. We'll talk about that as we progress through the syllabus. But let's come back to Locke. Locke justified equality, inequality on the grounds uh, of the fact that everybody was starting at the same time. So he uh, gives you what is called the metaphor of a race. You, if you've seen athletics, if you've seen the Olympics, you have the 100 meters dash. Let us take that as an example. If you take that as an example, you see people line up. They take their positions on the starting blocks. And when they are ready, a shot is fired. And as soon as the shot is fired, people start running. That is the equality of beginning. Nobody is running before the shot is fired. If anybody does, then they ask them to go back to the blocks again, to the starting blocks again. So nobody starts in advance. Everybody starts at the same time, right? So. Locke argued that there is equality of beginning and inequality of consequence. Consequences, everybody who's running the race can run, but those who are running faster than the others are the ones who win the race. The, Consequence, inequality of consequence is this. Some can run faster than others, though everybody can run. John Locke hadn't met me. He didn't know that there are people like me who can barely walk, leave alone, run. Okay, so uh, I used to compare myself to an elephant. And I found that elephants can run up to a speed of 40 kilometers per hour. So after that, I stopped comparing myself to an elephant. I now think I'm uh, not fit to be even called an elephant or any other animal. I am number one in a field of one. I can't run, I can't walk, whatever. Sad joke. My jokes are all sad. That's anyway. Uh, so you are therefore saying that all are rational. That is the equality of beginning for uh, John Locke. But all of them are not equally rational. The more rational ones are the ones who have accumulated more property. This is a position that we cannot accept today or we could not have accepted even as long back as 200 years ago. For example, Rousseau found it difficult to accept this position of locks. And the reason why he found it difficult to accept this position of locks 
is that uh, Locke, he says, doesn't take into consideration the accident of birth. The accident of birth is an important phrase because when we are talking about the accident of birth, we are talking about people not choosing their parents. They are not choosing the social stratum into which they are born. Somebody is born as the son of Mukesh Ambani. He's already got truckloads of money, several truckloads of money. Somebody is born as a daily wage laborer's child and is born into poverty, doesn't get anything. So where is the equality of beginning? There is no equality of beginning. Some people get a head start in life some people can send their children to America. They can send them to England for studies because they think studies in India are not good enough. But most pe there are several other people who can't even send their children to schools. They have a right to education, but people don't have the, this thing to send children to schools. So these are remaining uneducated. So what is this equality of beginning? But don't think that Locke is an idiot who couldn't see this. You must understand that Lockean times are the times when the old feudal society that was there uh, in Europe and especially England was dying. The feudal society was dying because it lost the ability to generate social wealth. So in this situation, everybody became poor, including the feudal lords including the feudal lords, people started becoming poor. The king became poor. The king of England became poor. Poor relative to the others, not that he went around with a begging bowl, bowl uh, but uh, he did become poorer than what he was. And this provided opportunities to do something else other than what people were doing in the feudal period where the economy was driven by agriculture. Some people saw this as an opportunity to start mercantile capitalism. They became merchants they traveled to China, to India. They bought spices from here. And uh, they sent these spices uh, to different... Uh, uh, they went back with these spices, sold them for a profit. And therefore, that became a new way of life in which those who were willing to dare were actually in a position where they could make money and get ahead of others. So this is what I mean by mirroring reality. Okay, the reality of that time was that, you know, people could actually seize newer opportunities, even create newer opportunities, 
of earning money and becoming rich. And so Locke's entire political philosophy is actually a defense of private property. It is a defense of private property. Now, in that sense, is political philosophy mirroring reality? Yes, it is. It definitely is mirroring reality of that particular time. But when we see what happened later, is it still mirroring reality? Yes, because Rousseau saw what Locke didn't. Locke only saw the beginnings of capitalism. He saw that as a solution to poverty. He genuinely believed that capitalism was solution to poverty, which nobody believes today. And it all started with Rousseau, the questioning of this idea that capitalism is a solution to poverty. Why? Because Rousseau saw what he called a paradox or a contradiction in capitalism. He said in feudal society, when it was on its way out, everybody became poor. And therefore, everybody more or less lost their livelihoods lost their lifestyles. And when it flourished, the whole of society was impacted in a positive way, in spite of the fact that there was a hierarchy, a feudal hierarchy. But nevertheless, everybody did have something for themselves, whether they were peasants or artisans, they were not as rich as the lords but they did have some money. But in capitalism, he saw a paradox or a contradiction and he called this the paradox of poverty amidst plenty. Feudalism saw poverty because it could not generate social wealth it lost the ability to generate social wealth. And because of that, there was poverty all around. But in capitalism, Locke said there would be no poverty. Rousseau said, I see poverty. I see poverty everywhere. He claimed that in capitalism, there is a problem of distribution of social wealth. Social wealth is definitely being created. There is no doubt about it. And he believed that this social wealth, which was being created, was not being shared by everyone. So despite there being plenty of social wealth, a surfeit of social wealth, not everybody benefited. Only some people kept becoming richer and richer. And some people kept becoming poorer and poorer. So you have this wonderful example that you can see in uh, Mumbai. You have this great man who goes by the name of Mukesh Ambani, who has a house which has 24 floors. And you have Asia's biggest slum. Dharavi. And in Dharavi, what do you see? People are jam-packed together like sardines 
in a can. Okay, so some people are living in luxury. You go to the Juhu area. This is where all the film stars and all the social glitterati, the rich, they live there. They are rarely seen in public. Even when they go out, they go in their expensive limousines. You don't get to see them because they have their glasses of the cars or whatever tinted. You don't get to see those people at all. But they are there. They party. They have fun. And on the other hand, you have this Dharavi. There are several slums, but I'm mentioning Dharavi because Dharavi is the biggest slum in Asia. So you see this richness and poverty existing side by side. So this is the paradox of poverty amidst plenty. And Rousseau was the first one to talk about the accident of birth, where he said, we don't choose where we are born. So what if I am born in Dharvi instead of, say, being born in one of the houses of Juhu or in Mukesh Ambani's house. What of that? How do you explain your equality of beginning? There is no equality of beginning. It is inequality right from the beginning. So the difference is that what John Locke saw looked like a hopeful situation. It looked like a very, very hopeful situation because it was a new thing that was happening. And so he thought that it would create plenty of opportunities. It would create jobs and therefore there would be no poverty. He didn't say there'll be equality, but he said there will be no poverty. Some people will be richer than the others. But there would be no poverty. But Rousseau saw a different reality. Rousseau saw a reality where there is poverty. Right next to richness. So, times change. Political philosophy changes. Rousseau, therefore, wanted not this civil society. He was against civil society of the type that John Locke talked about. He called it the bourgeois civil society, which is where the selfish man is. And he wanted to create a city-state that would give equal political rights to all people and enable them to take part in decision making and through that have access to social wealth. Says less than one minute, so I'll stop here. Tomorrow, I'll just wind up with this point quickly and then we go to the final point and then we'll be through. Okay, so thank you very much.